that this is a, a kind of section of um, a book project that I'm working on that looks at reproduction as both promise and threat. Um, and most of this today will see reprodu reproduction absolutely um, as threat. So uh, without further ado, um, at Documenta 13 in 2012, um, Carolyn Christoph Barkagiev made much of the idea that the exhibition lacked any unifying theme. Um, and yet amongst the various strands of the exhibition, and there were many, um, one was particularly prominent. And this was an attachment to what one critic called the emplaced condition of things. Um, so in the rotunda of the Fredericianum, um, which was the, the brain of the exhibition, a number of objects exemplified this concern. Uh, there were 4,000-year-old Bactrian princess figurines from Central Asia, and also artifacts um, from the National Museum in Beirut that had been damaged during the Lebanese Civil War. So these are objects that are very much inscribed by time. Um, they're about as far away from free-floating signifiers as we can get. Um, so to put it in Walter Benjamin's terms, they absolutely privilege cult value over exhibition value. They're singular objects, completely inextricable from their material histories, absolutely incompatible with the compressed and copied life of a JPEG. So set both against the textualist model of culture that's often associated with postmodernism, um, and also against the frenzied circulation proper to globalization, here, as throughout, I think, a lot of documenta, we find a return to the reference. Um, what we might call the eminently authentic. So the deployment of authenticity in Documenta is notable in part because it participates in a rehabilitation of a notion that had actually been quite out of fashion um, for quite some time. If not since Adorno allied its jargon with fascism, um, then definitely after uh, the post-structuralist critique of essence and origin. The rhetoric of authenticity tends to partake of notions of pure beginnings, and it denigrates what comes later, which is marked as contaminating or um, corrupting, even. So for Adorno, discourses of authenticity offered a rearticulation of the ideology of national socialism by other means, um, while for a lot of the structuralist thinkers, being attached to authenticity meant being guilty of an investment in presence and identity. Um, that was valorized really at the expense of recognizing difference and hybridity. So for all of these reasons, authenticity tended to get left behind um, or rejected in favor of purposeful originality or an embrace of unoriginality, rather, or an embrace of uh, reproducibility. So what I'd like to talk about today is the way that we might think authenticity as making a major comeback um, in contemporary culture more generally and also in some aspects of contemporary artistic and curatorial practice. Um, so in its concern with authentic images, Documenta 13 was far from alone. Um, in the Encyclopedic Palace, um, Massimiliano Gioni's um, exhibition at the last Venice Biennale, we saw madness, the unconscious, and outsiders um, as proposed as antidotes to the commodification of the art system and the professionalized artist. So whether in uh, Rudolf Steiner's Blackboards or Sinichi Sawada's Spiked Figurines, um, throughout the exhibition, we saw repeated gestures towards forms of artistic production supposedly motivated by urges deep and pure. Um, not by, say, money, fame, or any kind of linear narrative of our historical <coughs> intervention. Um, as the placement of Camille Rose's video Grosse Fatigue near the, exhibit, near the front of um, the exhibition made very clear, um, the exhibition was in part about the idea that the internet constitutes the latest iteration in a much longer tradition of um, a desire for totalizing structures of knowledge. Um, 
And yet, despite that, we can say that the internet was largely rejected by much of the rest of the exhibition, um, though not all. Um, the three spiritual fathers governing the exhibition, Jung, Steiner, and Breton, embrace a depth model of the subject, um, very closely tied to the idea of authenticity as a moral imperative. Um, and this is, of course, something that is exceedingly far from a lot of the models of subjectivity that are often proposed as coming about in a network culture. Um, beyond exhibitions like Documenta 13 and the Encyclopedic Palace, um, we could also speak of the attachment to outmoded technologies um, and also to the palpable return of craft. Um, so 16 millimeter film projection Stage is a contestation of the ubiquity and novelty of the digital image with figures like Luther Price, and this is a still um, from one of his works, and also Paolo, Paolo Kirkusai, privileging the materiality of the medium and claiming it as a damaged lived body subject to entropic decay. We can also think of Tino Segal's refusal to document his work. Um, and this is something that I think really further rehearses an attachment to singularity and presence um, while resisting reproduction. And the resistance to reproduction um, is precisely what authenticity is all about. Um, but authenticity is not simply a feature of contemporary artistic practice. It's also something that we see um, really dominating certain marketing strategies particularly in the domains of food and travel, as I'll speak a little bit about later, um, but not only. So what all of these examples speak to in some way is an allergy to mass production and also uh, mass reproduction of images, of experience, of subjects, and of objects. Um, so these are examples that really position themselves in some way against circulation and against the exchange principle. They, they elevate the authentic, which is always anachronistic in some way. They elevate that anachronism above and beyond a contemporary moment that is seen to be full of false, unreal, simulated experiences. Um, so what I would like to do today is think a little bit about what's at stake in this resuscitation of the authentic. Um, can it be anything other than very conservative and reactionary? Um, and also to think about how we might understand this as um, a post-digital cultural formation. So in order to do this, um, I'll be sort of leapfrogging back to the late 19th century, um, because this is the moment when the discourse of authenticity um, very much takes shape. And so what I'll hope to do is perhaps propose that these late 19th century ideas can in a way provide um, some kind of illumination of our contemporary moment because the late 19th century, like our own time, um, is marked by this massive change in the circulation and reproduction of images. So, um, in his 1759 text, Conjectures on Original Composition, Edward Young asks, Born original, how comes it to pass that we die copied? So this is a question that is rooted very much in a romantic conviction, one that's often aligned with the thought of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, that sees society as destructive of the authenticity and originality of human subjects. So in the late 19th century, this was an idea that um, became increasingly current as new processes of technological reproduction forever altered the subject's relationship to time, work, leisure, and experience more generally. Industrial modernity proceeded as a rationalization of all aspects of life driven by a capitalist economy, prompting some not to see it as progress, but rather as experiential impoverish impoverishment. So as an emblem of this collapse of difference, the copy comes to be particularly denigrated. So very much in line with Young's rhetoric, in the mid-19th century, we see works of literature, such as Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, 
and also Herman Melville's Bartleby, um, as communicating the extinguishing of the soul of their main protagonists by casting those men in the profession of manual copyists. Um, and this is a real transformation of how we might understand the idea of the copyist, because in a pre-modern context, it would actually be um, very much tied to the production of knowledge and to erudition, because the manual copyist par excellence would, of course, be the monk manually reproducing manuscripts. Um, in the mid-19th century, this shifts, and the copyist becomes a figure of um, boredom and spiritual sickness. So copying becomes mere drudgery. Um, it's a synecdoche that's used to point to a kind of lapsarian idea of modernity, modernity as a crisis of individual authenticity and experience. So Young's assertion that we all are born originals um, articulates a conviction that we begin life as essentially true to ourselves um, before experiencing some kind of progressive estrangement that might take the form of a false outer self concerned with being for others. Um, and this is something that Jean-Paul Sartre which much, would much later term bad faith. It's a very similar idea. Um, so rather than a yearning for originality, as um, Young's use of the term originals would suggest, um, this sentiment is perhaps better understood as a desire for authenticity. Um, because the authentic is, first and foremost, a subjective ideal. Um, and it's invested very much with a heavy moral weight. Um, it emerges in the 19th century as a polemical concept that's meant to revive a fullness of meaning and an unalienated state of being, precisely at the moment when those things seem to be slipping away. Um, so in the absence of the transcendent or the eternal, um, the desire for an authentic self, for a truth to oneself, comes to stand in um, as the only ground of moral good. Uh, but though authenticity is a subjective ideal, it actually comes from the world of objects, um, and more specifically, from the world of art objects. It comes from the museum um, and from the tradition of connoisseurship. Um, it also quickly returns to it as authenticity becomes a way of talking not just about subjectivity, but about the relationship between the subject and the new object world of mechanically reproduced things. Um, so with an etymology, meaning self-made, authenticity is by definition anti-technological, and it's about elevating the human over and above the new machine. Um, so this is a quote from Lionel Trilling, Sincerity and Authenticity, which I think was circulated for today. Um, Trilling writes, the anxiety about the machine is a commonplace in 19th century moral and cultural thought. It was the mechanical principle quite as much as the acquisitive principle, the two of course intimately connected, which was felt to be the enemy of being the source of inauthenticity. The machines that Ruskin could make only inauthentic things, dead things. And the dead things communicated their deadness to those who used them. So this mistrust of machines emerges at a time when many handicraft traditions were being replaced by automation, and when we have the implementation of rationalized um, production manufacturing processes. Um, that meant that workers no longer had to make something start to finish, but would repeat a single, um, isolated gesture again and again. So against this idea of a lifeless mechanical assemblage, the authentic um, object or mode of production is marked by an organic wholeness. Um, the authentic is presumed to be outside the regime of equivalence and sameness, that guides this mechanical form of production, um, and therefore outside the realm of reproducibility. Um, so Benjamin writes, for instance, the whole sphere of authenticity eludes technological, and of course, not only technological, reproduction. So it's closely aligned with nature, art, and craft, and also earlier forms of existence. 
Um, so one encounters at this moment a partitioning of the world into what is authentic on the one hand and what is new um, on the other. So authenticity emerges as a key criterion, not just for the worthiness of individual existence, but also um, for the worthiness of things. So it offers a way of making value judgments within a phantasmagoria of commodity culture. It enables one to mark out a distinction between a degraded mass of copies on the one hand and the exalted originals of artistic production on the other. Um, so for Trilling, the work of art is not simply one um, repository of authenticity amongst others, but actually the prototypical example from which all authenticity might be thought to emanate. So speaking of um, the consumer of art, um, he writes that the expectation is that through communication with the work of art, which may be resistant, unpleasant, or even hostile, um, he can acquire the authenticity of which the object itself is the model and the artist the personal example." End quote. So older modes of image making and traditional forms of experience are valorized because they're seen to offer an escape um, from the instability and uncertainty of a, ra a rapidly changing present. Um, so it's within this context that we can begin to understand the fetish for craft and also for the outmoded um, that emerged then and also now. Um, so within the authenticity paradigm, the relationship between subject and object is one of mimetic contagion. Um, Ruskin believed that dead things would communicate their deadness to those who encountered them. Um, so the idea is that there is a kind of transfer as if through a form of sympathetic magic, um, whereby coming into contact with too many of inauthentic things might diminish your own personal authenticity. Um, but conversely, surrounding yourself with authentic things, especially works of art, for example, um, might be seen to buttress your personal um, authenticity. So concerns with authenticity um, were very central to these Lapsarian critiques of modernity um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and we see clock time, the cinema, and the assembly line emerging as um, inauthentic things thought to hamper um, the possibility of individuals living an authentic life. Um, but it's very important to note that authenticity is not a value that exists in and of itself, um, but it's always something that is relational. So for Benjamin, um, in a footnote to the third uh, version of the work of art essay, um, he very much acknowledges this relational temporality of authenticity. And he sees new technologies as actually enabling um, the rise of authenticity where none had been before. So the kind of idea that is always repeated is that the aura of the work of art withers in the age of mechanical reproduction. Um, but in fact, at least in this footnote, um, Benjamin acknowledges that in fact, the aura of the work of art is perhaps born out of mechanical reproduction. Um, so he writes, precisely because authenticity is not reproducible, the intensive penetration of certain technological processes of reproduction was instrumental in differentiating and gradating authenticity. To be sure, a medieval picture of the Madonna at the time it was created could not yet be said to be authentic. It became authentic only during the succeeding centuries and perhaps most strikingly so during the 19th. Um, so it's absolutely something that has a kind of diachronic evolution, but will especially take shape at moments of massive technological novelty. Um, so authenticity is always in some way non-contemporaneous. Non um, it comes into view as a temporality that will break in some way with the present. Um, so to fast forward now um, to our own time, 
I think we can say that digitization has resulted in a radical transformation of the mobility of images and sounds, um, somewhat tantamount to that of um, roughly 100 years ago, or I guess now more than 100 years ago. And once again, the concept of authenticity has emerged as a way of triangulating a relationship um, between subject, image, or object, and society. Um, so just as in the late 19th century, what is authentic continues to be defined against that which is new, um, except ubiquity and novelty are now the property of digital media, um, rather than, say, photographic and um, mechanically reproducible cinematic images. <coughs> so the technological changes that have occurred over the past 25 years or so have occurred in conjunction with economic deregulation, the restructuring of labor, and the remapping of global flows of people, capital, and information. Um, so in short, they occur as a part of a much broader transformation of experience um, that is in many ways as immense and as wide-ranging as that of the late 19th century. And I think if you look at the writings of theorists who are particularly pessimistic about this transformation, whether that's someone like Baudrillard or someone like Virilio, um, you'll hear echoes of this 19th century authenticity discourse really um, quite strongly. So against um, the promiscuous circulation of proliferating copies, we've seen quite recently a massive resurgence in the singular moment of performance. Um, and we see now as well that even photochemical film, which had been the, the exemplary inauthentic image, um, can now be recuperated as authentic, as the images of electronic reproduction have now arrived to occupy that denigrated position um, of the copy. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting, though, that even in um, the 19th century moment, the status of authenticity was quite vexed, um, and we could say, I think, deeply, deeply ambivalent. So on the one hand, authenticity was valued as a site of resistance to the dehumanization and also the disenchantment of capitalist exchange. Um, but on the other hand, it was absolutely deplored, often by the very same writers that were valuing it. Um, it was also deplored for its class character. Um, because access to the authentic, after all, tends to be quite exclusive. Um, and so understood in this second sense, authenticity is in no way an escape from the exchange principle or from a market logic. Um, it could just be seen as a way of cloaking a longing for the rare or for the expensive in spiritual romantic terms. Um, so this is something that Boltansky and Schiapello pick, on, pick up on very much in their book, um, The New Spirit of Capitalism. They describe how authenticity was really a key, key term in what they call the artistic critique of capitalism in the 19th century. And the artistic critique of capitalism is a critique of capitalism that sees it as a source of disenchantment and of authenticity. And so they write that this is a critique that foregrounds the loss of meaning, and in particular, the loss of a sense of what is beautiful and valuable, which derives from standardization and generalized commodification, affecting not only everyday objects, but also artworks through the cultural, cultural mercantilism of the bourgeoisie and human beings. So here, with this artistic critique of capitalism, we can say that authenticity could provide a response, could provide a radical response to this idea that capitalism involves a loss of a sense of what is beautiful and valuable. Um, but as a part of what Boltansky and Schiapello call the social critique of capitalism, um, which is an objection to inequality and to the selfishness of private interest, um, here, the attachment to the authentic is deplored for its class character. 
Um, because authenticity can, after all, be seen as a really reactionary value um, that's interested, above all, in preserving the status quo and guarding against the promise of the new um, and whatever positive change or even democratization um, that it might bring. Um, Theodore Adorno was someone who really emphasized, on the whole, the negative aspect of the authenticity discourse for this very reason. Um, he saw it as something that was always retroactively constructed and fully residing within the paradigm of commodity exchange. Um, so he wrote, um, only when countless standardized commodities project for the sake of profit the illusion of being unique, does the idea take shape as their antithesis, yet in keeping with the same criteria, that the non-reproducible is truly genuine? So the idea that what cannot be reproduced is genuine is, for Adorno, absolutely a symptom of the very same system of sameness. Um, so this idea of a false projection of uniqueness um, stemming from a ground of sameness is something that I think is particularly apposite today um, in an age of niche markets and customizable products. Um, so if Fordist capitalism succeeded in produ producing um, seductive commodities that deliver the ever same as the ever new, um, our contemporary moment in some way witnesses the continuance of this regime um, but also the addition of this seemingly infinite variety of the long tail and the fantasy of completely individualized consumption. So when everything appears to be available at the click of a mouse, ever more strongly does it take shape that the non-reproducible is what is truly genuine. I never thought that I would buy a book published by the Harvard Business School Press. But then I did. And this is an image from the cover. Um, this is a book um, published in 2007 by James H. Gilmore and Joseph B. Pine. Um, and Joseph B. Pine II, sorry. Um, and it's called Authenticity, What Customers Really Want. Um, and this is a book that tries to seize on this desire for authenticity that emerges from um, a, a perception of digital sameness, from a perception that digital culture and the availability of seemingly everything is leveling out um, the cultural field and providing maybe an opportunity for someone to make a lot of money off of selling something that would disrupt that leveling. Um, so they write, um, quote, in a world increasingly filled with deliberately and sensationally staged experiences in an increasingly unreal world, customers choose to buy or not buy based on how real they perceive an offering to be. Business today, therefore, is all about being real, original, genuine, sincere, authentic. So, this idea accords marketing strategies the same role that has traditionally been assigned to the work of art um, to provide an alternative to what is, right? to provide another kind of experience that would disrupt that market logic. Um, except that here, rather than any true challenge to this affirmative culture, um, the goal is to sell products through an operation that dissimulates the relationship to commodity exchange by superficially adopting the guise of what is supposed to reside outside of the realm of commodity exchange, which is namely the authentic. So in a world of what they call technological intrusion, Pine and Gilmore argue, businesses can add value by rendering authenticity. Um, and this book is made up of a kind of compendium of strategies. It's like a playbook, if you're a business owner, for all of the ways that you can render authenticity for your customers. Um, and so guidelines for doing this include things like an absolute prohibition on proclaiming yourself to be authentic. Right? Because if you are, you don't have to say it. That's like the first rule. 
Um, and one of the other things that they suggest, which is quite interesting and which will come up um, in the example I'll show a little bit later on, is an imperative to humanize all interactions with technology. To, so to somehow disrupt the idea of a prepackaged, reproducible um, experience facilitated by a machine. Um, you may have heard of Gilmore and Pine II before, um, because they actually became quite well known, I think, within an art context due to the success of their first book, which was called The Experience Economy, Work is a Theater, and Every Business is a Stage. Um, and this was a book that was discussed by critics that were interested in understanding um, how the practice is grouped for better or for worse under the label of relational aesthetics might dovetail with broader transformations of capital. Um, so in this book, they take Walt Disney as a foundational example. Um, and they try and instruct businesses how to offer something unusual, how to sell not just a product, but how to sell an experience um, that customers will feel has been crafted just for them. Um, so authenticity is what happens after everything has become an experience, right? Because then things have to be not just an experience, but in fact an authentic experience. So if there's a correlation um, to be found between the strategies described in the experience economy and certain artistic practices of the 1990s, um, the question is then whether we can also make a correlation between what's described here in authenticity as a new um, consumer sensibility and certain kinds of artistic practices gaining attention uh, within the last 15 years or so. Um, one crucial, crucial difference between the practices correlated with the experience economy and those aligned with the desire for authenticity is that um, the practices correlated with the experience economy made no claims um, to reside outside of the dominant cultural logic. Um, so even though someone like Nicolas Borio might make emancipatory claims on behalf of uh, particular artists and their work, um, in many cases, a closer exa examination of that work shows that there's something much more ambivalent um, at play. But authenticity, by contrast, derives its power um, precisely because it's meant to be an alternative to rather than an engagement with. Um, our contemporary moment. So it seeks to remedy a supposed lack. It's a fundamentally conservative withdrawal from the present. Um, so for some, this is enough to mark it as inherently reactionary and to disqualify it as any kind of viable strategy. Um, so Stephen Shaviro, for example, opposes so-called slow cinema on these grounds. Um, you can argue about what slow cinema is exactly, but Shaviro is talking about the work of people like Simon Lang and Pichat Ponger Sethical, and he claims um, that that kind of protracted narrativity, those extremely long takes, um, this idea of creating a cinema that prizes durational experience, all of this um, is what he calls an evasive cop-out because it doesn't engage with what it feels like to live today. He says it's a profound failure of the imagination and a retreat into fantasies of the good old days. So one might say the same thing about the deployment of authenticity in contemporary art. We could set it against the work of artists who more straightforwardly engage with the vicissitudes of digital existence. Um, but I think that would be perhaps too easy. And I wonder that even though those criticisms of authenticity are um, quite easy to make, I wonder if perhaps maybe we might want to, um, as, as Benjamin mentioned, gradate and differentiate between uh, different forms of authenticity. Um, so the, the various deployments of authenticity might be united in their status as rear guard responses to anxieties provoked by the perceived ubiquity and sameness of digital culture. 
Um, but I do think we can mark out distinctions. Um, so here's one first example. It's actually an advertisement for my home province of Newfoundland in Canada. And it was a part of an advertising campaign that won some awards and was talked about um, a lot. And it's really kind of a by the book rendering of authenticity. This is exactly a minute long. place exactly? It's about as far from Disneyland as you can possibly get. Newfoundland and Labrador. I know. I couldn't have made it up, you know. Uh, but these ads were a huge deal. And, um, like, uh, like tourism revenue in the province skyrocketed through this advertising campaign. Um, so here we have picturesque rural life, um, sort of strange place names, and there are weirder ones even than they chose. Um, and we have the declaration that this is a place as far away from Disneyland as you can get. Um, other ads in this series um, said, find yourself here. So it's again that idea of authenticity as a finding of oneself, um, as getting in touch with one's true inner nature. Uh, and at the end of the ad, I'm not sure if you noticed, but it says to call Eileen on a 1-800 number. And this is one of a series of ads, and each one says to call somebody, like call John or call Eileen. Um, and of course, Eileen isn't going to be on the line when you call the 1-800 number, um, but the authentic is always closely aligned with the human and positioned against the machine. Um, and I mentioned that Pine and Gilmore say that businesses should humanize their interactions, uh, their customers' interactions with technology, and that's precisely what's happening um, in this idea of calling Eileen. It's not calling a call center. I mean, it is, but you're calling Eileen. Um, but we could very much ask um, what kind of origin is being called upon um, in this advertising campaign because uh, the authentic is always a return to an origin of some kind. And this one is perhaps more interesting even than some of the other ones because it includes um, the dates of the founding of a number of these towns. And I think the ideas were meant to be like, wow, they're old, they've been around for a long time. Um, but in fact, what we see here is the proclamation of European settlement <laughs> as the origin of Newfoundland culture. Um, so it completely overwrites the genocide of indigenous peoples living on that land and saying that the, the pure origin of Newfoundland culture is this moment of European settlement. Um, so it's, it's, it's a completely, completely false origin. Um, but one that is quite good, I guess, for, you know, getting tourism revenue. Um, so, that's perhaps one almost too easy way of showing um, the kind of spurious authenticity that we see proliferating in um, contemporary culture. But to return to my opening example, um, I wonder if we can say the same thing about the damaged artifacts um, from Beirut. So here, we can say that the force of time and the absolute singularity of these objects are palpable. We have mangled pieces of metal and glass 
that challenge the idea that the value of the art object is a matter of aesthetics alone. Um, and it instead insists on the way that social and political relationships and histories can be embedded in material objects. Um, so these are not objects that are isolated in any way from the passage of time, but rather poignant testimonies of violence and trauma. So they're reminders of the contingent circumstances by which some things endure while other things perish. Um, I mentioned that Adorno is one of the harshest critics of authenticity out there. Um, but despite the, the fact that he articulated this very scathing critique of authenticity in an administered world, singling out Heidegger especially um, as guilty of this, um, he did nonetheless hold on to the possibility of an honorific use of the term authenticity. And he locates it um, he locates the authentic in what is vulnerable and what is transient rather than what is pure and fixed. So he writes um, in his aesthetic theory, scars of damage and disruption are the modern seal of authenticity. By their means, art desperately, sorry, desperately negates the closed confines of the ever same. Um, so though the objects in the document of brain um, invoke the rhetorics of singularity and authenticity, they recognize the arrogance and also I think the artificiality of any easy return to some moment of a pure, uncontaminated origin. Um, and they instead locate the authentic in objects that index rather than deny the frailty and difficulty of being in the world. Um, so in this, they really repudiate this possibility of retreating into a glorified past. Um, but they also, in some way, still call on that, anachron that anachronism um, to, to sort of unsettle the logic of our present and of this obsession with circulation. Um, so unlike the return to the depth model of the subject that was very much at play um, throughout the Encyclopedic Palace at Venice, um, here we have a consideration of the life of objects that I think avoids many of the pitfalls of the old authenticity discourses while maintaining that ability to mobilize the anachronism of the authentic as a challenge to our present. Um, so I've ended with these two very different examples um, to demonstrate the two kind of ends of the spectrum of how we might see authenticity as being deployed. Um, but I think much more often we find much more conflicted examples, and indeed examples in which we might find um, the, the real ambivalence of authenticity contained within a single object. So it's conservative ugliness on the one hand, and it's anachronistic promise on the other. Um, and I think, for instance, the fetishization of 16 millimeter film would be um, one place where we can often see both of those things operating together at once. Um, but whatever um, the instantiation is, I think it's important to recognize the extent um, to which this resuscitation of the authentic is a persistent reminder that there is both a value um, but also a danger in the rejection of things as they are. Thank you. Yeah, my home problem. So you, you don't have an evocative name? Like, no. Uh, 
Well, I guess I guess the thing that it made me think of was this this concept, this quite English concept of betweenness. Mm -hmm. right? um, I don't know if people are familiar with this, this idea of a kind of very self-conscious, um, uh, you know, a celebration of heritage that becomes a kind of caricature. And it, and it strikes me that maybe that, that there's a conceptual kind of performative paradox about the concept of authenticity, um, which is being staged in, in that kind of thing, which is, but which we can think about in maybe other ways, like the, in a way it's a bit like the concept of naivety, right, in a way that as soon as you say, I am naive, you kind of, you know, you are, that's at the moment self-awareness implies that you're not. And that maybe there's a kind of uh, a structural um, uh, paradox in the enunciation of authenticity. So I think, for example, you know, to take it back to artworks again, um, some people here may know the work of Hugh Barnett, um, who's an English conceptual artist, and, and the very famous piece he had where he's just holding a board that says, I'm a real artist. And you know, and again, about all of the, the kind of production of paradox of that. So that's the first question. But the second one, I mean, I guess whether you think that that's something that, um, uh, you know, in a sense, is that, is that self consciousness the problem? I mean, is that a product of a certain kind of um, discourse modernity? But, the, but the, the second would be, I, I, to kind of talk a little bit more about the, the concept of the digital, the digitally authentic. And I was, when you were talking, I was kind of struck by, um, I was thinking about a text, I think again a lot of people here know, which is Ito Sale's text on the poor image. And it seems, I think one way of understanding Ito Sale's idea of the, um, the concept of the poor image and, the, and what poor images tell us is that they have a kind of, um, uh, that their degradation, their low resolution, the way in which we can see the traces of, the, of their um, compression and, and, the, and the kind of digital hands through which they pass becomes a new form of authenticity. It, it's, it's, the, it's the way in which we can see the scars of their reproduction that becomes a form of, of a new second order form of authenticity. So, so those are two very disparate uh, yeah. responses by one of you. Uh, I mean, I guess to briefly comment on the first one, I think that that kind of performative dimension, at least according to kind of orthodox ideas of authenticity, that would disqualify that those moments as authentic because they're about performing within a kind of network of relations rather than turning back on oneself, right? Because the authentic is always in some way uh, a truth to oneself rather than an interest in um, how one might appear to others, right? So the moment that there's this kind of outward performance, it would compromise authenticity. Um, but in terms of the, the, the remark about the poor image, I think that that's absolutely um, the case. Often there's this idea that it's the, the copy that um, is inherently inauthentic. But I think that the idea of um, traces of circulation being described within an image um, allows us, a mechanically or digitally reproducible image, allows us to think actually about the possibility of an authentic copy. Right, so that something becomes through reproduction um, infinitely different from other potential copies, right? Through the through the circulation pathways it might take. Um, and the work in particular that came to mind was Ben White and Eileen Simpson's struggle in Jiraj. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this work, but basically they they went to um, Amman, Jordan, on a residency. Um, planning to work with public domain music materials, but what they found was this film that had gone into the public domain 50 years after it had been released, because that's what happens in Jordan, which does not happen and will not happen in here or you know in, in America. Um, and the film had existed on 35 millimeter, was transferred to VHS. The print was then lost, so all they had was this very poor, poor, poor VHS copy. And then they um, digitized it and added a soundtrack of numerous people talking about seeing this film 50 years later. Um, and so there's a sense that there, um, there's a sense that the image is actually inscribed with the material specificity of there being, for example, no National Film Archive in Jordan that would take care of this work. Um, but you also have on the soundtrack the inscription of um, various processes of reception of people watching the work. And so that to me is a really, really interesting piece because I think that it is a necessary response to the way that in the wake of the popularity 
of that essay, the poor image has become a kind of aesthetic. It's become a look rather than actually something that engages with those pathways of circulation. And I think that that's um, a very important thing to do, that we're not just, again, fetishizing the appearance of um, a degraded copy, a, de a degraded copy, and instead we're actually thinking about what kinds of factors, whether they're technological or legal or infrastructural or whatever they might be, what kinds of factors actually intervene to either enable or prohibit um, those, those images from circulating. Other questions, comments, questions. An oil painting village, a all? Yes, I have. Because like that kind of offers an interesting example of the manual copyness, copyist, and yeah. it's kind of ironic because they're also copying European old masters and specifically someone like Van Gogh, and then but they're very much treated as inauthentic because mm -hmm. they're not original. I mean, there, I guess, you're venturing into kind of a different set of discourses about originality and authorship and artistic production. But um, I really want to read Winnie Wong's book. I've not read it yet, but I really want to read it. And I know that now at Dulwich Fisher Gallery, there is a copy from um, Deaf M that, that uh, Deaf Fishbone has commissioned and it's put up on view alongside works from the, the um, permanent collection. And it's like a kind of spot the coffee wager. But I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's I just yeah, I have read Whitney Wong's book and I think what's interesting it comes out is the relationship where the contemporary artists that are dealing with the uh, Daffin village and its projects obviously have the status of being more original and thus potentially I think more authentic mm -hmm. than the Daffin painters themselves. So yeah. yeah, I mean, because again, it's about inhabiting, it's about what kind of discourse you inhabit and what, I mean, what kinds of um, <coughs> institutional structures there are to bestow that authenticity upon the artist. Um, I'm just starting research on sort of defining the term of artistic autonomy. And I'm not very far along, but you're very interesting and no one else has a question, so. Um, so artistic autonomy is something sort of in relation to being autonomous from, from these historical references as well as institutions. And I'm wondering how you would relate authenticity to artistic autonomy, if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, I have never thought about that before, but now I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. But one, one sort of way of thinking about it maybe is to look at the sense that they're historically coincident. Like the move to artistic autonomy in the sense that we understand it today is also a kind of 19th century invention. Um, and it also has to do with a relationship to the marketplace, right? And I, I mean, yeah, as I said, I haven't thought about it before, but I'm, I, I would imagine that you could probably, if you really started thinking about the conjunction of those discourses, that something really interesting might turn up. What was the very first thing you said? That they're, that they're historically coincident. coincident. That they both kind of emerge in the late 19th century due to similar kinds of technological, economic, societal shifts. Um, so if you, I mean, if you read something like Peter Berger's theory of the avant-garde, that kind of takes us back to this moment in the late 19th century when you know there's a rejection of art for art's sake, and you get the avant-garde as we know it. But that is the sort of moment of autonomy that gets kind of followed through in, in histories of modernism, but I haven't, I haven't thought about it, but I will. Oh. Oh. Um, you never mentioned the word nostalgia. Um, do you think that's like a dirty word related to this kind of idea, or is it just like, uh, what do you think, I mean, is the relationship of that? like the nostalgia, how we define the object to be on there. Mm -hmm. 
I think that it's very profoundly, profoundly connected. Um, I think the reason that I have not spoken about nostalgia is because I think that it sort of introduces a whole other set of discourses that themselves are unclear, right? Like many people understand nostalgia in, in very, very different ways. There's, I mean, it's something, it's one thing to talk about American graffiti and nostalgia in kind of Jamestonian postmodernism, and it's something else to talk about who he says it's nostalgia for ruins or something like that. So there's a sense that it almost would maybe complicate things too much, but, um, so that's kind of why I didn't mention it, but um, I do think that that idea, I mean, nostalgia is the pain of returning, right? And the idea of authenticity is always about the impossibility of a return to an origin moment that is seen to be lost or seen to be contaminated or compromised. And as with nostalgia, it's an origin that perhaps you never had access to, that you never experienced yourself. And perhaps even because of that, that's why you want to recapture it even more. Um, so there are, I think, really profound similarities in that same kind of affective structure. I think that what talking about authenticity can get me, I guess, that talking about nostalgia cannot, is the relationship between subject and object. Because that's something that really interests me, the idea that um, in the kind of discourses of authenticity, the relationship between subject and object is thought of really as one of like mimetic contagion, so that you can catch inauthenticity or that you can catch authenticity. Um, and I'm really interested in thinking about why people, not people, but you know, uh, not individuals, but whatever, in a broader sense, why people are afraid of the copy. And um, this is one way of thinking about that, right? Of understanding that profound anxiety around proliferating copies. And it has to do, I think, with a kind of fear of a, a loss of subjective uniqueness. Hi. Um, this question isn't super well formed, but um, I was just wondering how you consider the idea of like radical newness or like um, like an event in history. Um, if if we agree with uh, Adorno that like all of our relations with objects should bear the weight of the world or like the scarification of of things and trauma. So um, yeah, I don't know if that relates to what you're talking about, but. Um, yeah, because I guess it would be kind of the opposite of the authentic, would be like something totally new, and I'm just wondering if, if you see that as a danger. I guess I would maybe mark out a distinction between what I think you're talking about, which would be like the idea of the event as like a radical novelty that absolutely changes the state of affairs. That kind of novelty and a much more banal form of novelty, which is sort of like technological innovation or novelty. Um, because I think that the sort of novelty that you're talking about is almost like a horizon where new things become thinkable or experienceable, just something that you know is, is really inhabiting a different kind of frame of reference than, than this, which I think is much more prosaic in a way. It's about a kind of like fear of new machines because they might take over our lives. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, I, hello. Uh, as you talked about the uh, that consumer products try to re replace the authenticity, and the customers want to buy product authenticity. And I'm wondering if that's kind of like the privilege to the customers who has already get very adapted to the modern life. Because like people who have never been to Disneyland, they will want to go to Disneyland rather than go, go to the authentic landscape. To Bhutan. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. And people who does not have the newest technology, they would rather want um, like iPhone 6s or something like that rather than um, pursuing the authenticity uh, through buying like artwork and things like that. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think there is a sense that the idea of authenticity is a kind of like vanguard consumer who has had it all and now is ready for almost like a, a return to something simpler in a way. I mean, Bhutan is very expensive to visit Bhutan. I didn't just pick that country randomly. Um, and I think that there is, um, there is a way in which this gets back to the old idea of authenticity being a kind of yearning for the rare, right? Um, and there is, there's a journalist, he's a Canadian journalist named Andrew Potter, who wrote a sort of mediocre, like, pop book called The Authenticity Hoax. Um, but the one really great concept that he has in it is called conspicuous authenticity. And this is his kind of transformation of the idea of conspicuous consumption. So instead of you know conspicuously buying a branded handbag or something like that, now it's actually about a certain kind of consumer, as you said, who's maybe a very niche consumer, who's interested in performing their um, investment in seeking out authentic products. And um, I don't, I don't really watch Portlandia, but I saw it like once, and I saw the chicken sketch where they give the whole kind of biography. They ask about the biography of the whole of the chicken's whole life and everything. And that's exactly the kind of consumer that we're talking about. I mean, you're absolutely right to say that it's a very particular type. Um, and I think that kind of modern food culture is one of the areas in which this idea of authenticity is played out really um, to an extreme. If you read menus, for example, and look at all of the ways that the provenance of the food is described, um, you know there are, there are very real reasons why we should care about where our food comes from and why we should be invested in the politics of food. But that's not always what's happening on those menus when all of those kinds of um, things of the purveyors and the towns and whatever are listed. So, yeah. Hi. Um, when, I have a question about when you talk about this contagiousness of um, um, the subject and object when you can catch this uh, authenticity. Is it also um, then intertwinable when you, as a person, are um, authentic that you can give this authenticity back? That's the figure of the artist. So one of, I mean, in, in, in Trilling's kind of gloss on, on the 19th century, he says that part of the reason why artistic objects come to be understood as authentic is not just because, you know, it, there's one painting and it's not reproducible, because um, we can say the same thing about, you know, a carving or something. The reason that the painting um, takes on this kind of tremendous amount of authenticity is because the figure of the artist is him or herself, the kind of paradigm of what it is to live an authentic existence. Right? To be completely um, unbound. By, I mean, I know this is complete, like you know, mythology, but this is the this is the idea that the sort of mythology of, of the artist's life is to be completely unbound by ideas of you know, normal convention or work days, divisions between work and leisure. Um, and there is a sense that the, the existence of the artist is this kind of paradigmatic authenticity. That is what it is to be true to yourself and that your work is all about self-expression and all of these kinds of cliches. And so the artist imparts the artwork with authenticity and then that can be transferred <coughs> back. Um, and there's a really, a film that I find really fascinating in this regard is, um, there's a, I think it's from 1901 or something like this, and it's called The Artist's Dilemma. And it basically dramatizes the nightmare of photography for this 19th century artist because the, the, the cinema or photography are kind of allegorized in this short little trick film as coming along and taking away something of the artist's um, authentic existence. And then, you know, the artist is completely bamboozled by these little imps who are, you know, the figures of cinema. Um, 
it's on YouTube. You can look it up. I'm not describing it very well, maybe. But the, the whole idea there is that it is all about this kind of prototype of um, the artistic subject who is somehow terrorized by the advent of mechanical reproduction. Um, I didn't quite understand your position. Are you kind of pro-sameness? <laughs> and uh, I, um, also um, didn't quite understand uh, about the reaction. Like, is it completely reactionary? Like, this return to authenticity? Is it is it just a reaction to to that sameness? Um, I mean, I would say I'm deeply ambivalent. Like, I. Um, I do think that there is a kind of potential value in the move away from an idea of total availability, super rapid circulation. Um, and I do think that there is a kind of power in kind of the anachronistic to disrupt that in some way. But I'm very, very suspicious of the way that it often plays out. You were talking about different gradations of the text. Yeah. Like what was well, so on the one hand, my sort of two uh, poles were the advertisement for Newfoundland on the one hand, and then the damaged um, objects from Lebanon in Documenta on the other. And there are many in between. I mean, even if you look at the work of someone like Tassad Adin, um, that to me is a very clear example of a profound ambivalence around authenticity because there's an absolute unrepentant fetishization of photochemical film. You know, repeated um, statements about the deadness of the digital. Um, but it's of course completely bound up in a kind of preciousness and a market logic and all of these other things. So it's both at once and I don't think that the um, promise of authenticity or the potential of authenticity is necessarily neutralized by those more spurious, um, like it's not a zero-sum game. I think that both can exist um, together. Um, so that's sort of where I stand, I guess. And so is it always reactionary? In a, not in the bad sense of reactionary, but in the sense of a reaction to something? Then yes, I would say it is. And authenticity tends to become a major concern precisely at moments of <laughs> massive um, technological or societal change. Right? So it is kind of a knee-jerk reaction to sort of return to something that you feel you can grasp onto um, a little bit more. OK, so yes, I, I agree with you that anything that's used by marketing people is deeply suspicious, right? Because it's like they seem to be very good, or they spend a lot of money being good at what ta taps people really inside. And then so there is this word that you, I think you haven't mentioned, but it's <coughs> truth, right? So there is, there is this thing, uh, and then you, you're already talking about also, you've been talking about the looks, <coughs> something that looks authentic, or the looks. Um, or, yeah, feel yeah, also. Yeah, exactly. So, and then there, is, there seems to be this real need for finding what the truth is. There seems to be a very kind of human yearning for, for the truth. And um, this is what this marketing people is definitely exploiting. Um, so, so, yeah, what would you, um, I kind of, I, I agree with the most of what I could cut that you were saying, but I would like to, to if you could say what you think about all these this issues with, you know, the truth. It, yeah, the kind yeah. of philosophical. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the whole um, the kind of moment when authenticity, as we know it today, is really invented, has to do with um, a loss of the absolute, the transcendent. I mean, God, I guess, if you like, as a point of reference. And so, if we can't keep that as a sort of um, kind of point of truth or point of orientation, we instead turn inward, right? And so the idea of being true to oneself, of, of living an authentic existence, um, becomes a kind of moral imperative in the absence of any external point that would be dependable as a kind of repository of truth. 
the only repository of truth we have, truth we have left is inside of ourselves. And throughout the 20th century, this plays out in all kinds of ways, like there's um, one philosopher, Charles Gagnon, who's talked about you know, um, Oprah and Dr. Phil and self-help culture as like one way that this obsession with like understanding who we really are plays out. Um, but I think that, I mean, that that's one of the sort of explanations is that it's when, when religion and tradition have kind of fallen away as a way of orienting ourselves that we have, we have nothing left except to turn inward. Um, I have a question uh, about um, the nature of um, film media and what you call the physical ah. contagion. And, um, Sorry, a question about what kind of media? About the nature of film media. Film, and, yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me sometimes that um, in current arguments about our post-digital condition, we, we carry an assumption that um, we once knew what analog media are, um, as if that were self-evident. And it's always struck me that, that, that actually analog media are very difficult to understand. And, and the nostalgia for them is, is also hard to hard to explain. And I wonder I mean, what you were saying about physical contagion made me think maybe that has something to do with it. There is a, a, a kind of magic that people seek in, in analog uh, production. Now, which they, they don't see, or a different kind of magic, kind of black box, a digital process. Yeah, I mean, I think it really has to do with contingency, doesn't it? I mean, if you think about the way that, for example, structural film tried to locate the medium specificity of celluloid in the late 60s and early 70s, um, it had to do often with um, flatness, film strip, emulsion, um, you know, the pan, the zoom. That's not at all how the specificity of photochemical film is located today in contemporary art. Um, it tends to have to do with a relationship to contingency, a relationship to historicity, and the idea of some kind of automatic analogical causation. So it's a kind of, it's an image that has some sort of indexical existential relation to the referent that is presumed to be more direct um, than the digital image, which you know, is thought to take up that trace of the world and break it up into binary code. It's thought to be more manipulable. Of course, you know, anal analogical photographs have always <coughs> been manipulated. Film has always been manipulated. But this is the way that this anxiety plays out. right? The digital becomes all about the intervention of the human hand through a computer mouse, right? Um, whereas photochemical film is seen to be something automatic and almost mystical or magical because of its connection to the real. Um, there are all kinds of ways that, you know, that kind of binary is not true on either side, but I think that's part of where this sort of investment um, comes from, in a, in a presumed relationship to contingency that is lost with the discreteness and the calculability of the digital image. And that, of course, is again, human against machine, right? Like the idea of kind of a, a chance and contingency is something that disrupts <coughs> that regularity of the machine. So that's the same kind of binarisms um, playing out there that tend to inform a lot of the discourses on authenticity. Yes. Uh, I was listening to what you were saying, and I think I forgot one of the questions I had in mind. Um, <coughs> How, what are we left with for the circulation of our work if the digital world is somehow mining this authenticity as artists? Because I mean, we've got to make the work available in a certain way. You know, uh, that's the first question. Yeah. And the second question is about about Adorno. This this the idea of scars of damage, of damage and disruption more the modern still. I mean, if I think about scars and damage. I relate it to time. Mm -hmm. You have the, you got to, it, it scars are like as experiences. I mean, if you're not, I don't know, if you don't, if you haven't lived certain things, you cannot transfer a certain level of authenticity. I mean, 
I don't necessarily agree with that, and I would like you to tell me what you think about it, because it's like saying, oh, under 30, you cannot talk about certain things, or if you haven't lived certain things, you cannot talk about certain things, but I mean, there has to, there have to be another way around, because I mean, it's like saying your experiences has a certain value. Well, here, um, Adorno, the idea of scar, it's not about um, personal experience that one might put into an artwork or not. Here, it's about actually an object, right? An object that would bear those scars or those kind of moments of disruption. So how this could be registered in practice, completely separately from what the person has or has not experienced. Um, but in terms of your first question, so um, the, this is the part of the book project that I'm working on that is about how artists and filmmakers and some theorists have thought about reproduction. And it tends to kind of, I mean, there's an ambivalence in the middle, but it tends to split into two camps, reproduction as threat, but reproduction as promise, right? And the attachment to authenticity sees reproduction as threat. But what you're mentioning, I think, goes down the other path, which is that reproduction and circulation can be a kind of democratizing problem. And so in a way, there have been just as many artists who have been absolutely interested in the possibility of you know, multiple fabrication or digital dissemination um, and have found in that a way of providing a kind of rebuttal to this fascination with you know, singular objects and authenticity as something that they see as essentially elitist. Right? So that's the other side of the coin in a way. And I think that um, they operate very much together. And it's up to each person, or each theorist, each artist, filmmaker, whatever, to kind of figure out where their take on it is. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask about um, obscurity. Um, I've been reading uh, Retromania by Simon Reynolds, and there's a bit of uh, uh, the Northern Soul scene and how that was seen as very much about getting the rarest singles. And that kind of, as it went on, it was kind of running out of steam, I guess, because you know there's not that much more material out there to mine, and people go to great lengths to kind of hide the records they were playing. Um, and, so I was kind of how you see sort of obscurity relating to um, the authenticity and <coughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's really interesting because a lot of the um, instantiations of authenticity in recent art practice tend to be kind of old media in some way or another, right? Um, but there's a way in which this meets up with a kind of vanguard of new media theory in this shared investment in obscurity or in disappearance. So there are all kinds of people who have talked about um, the need to disappear, right? the need to become imperceptible, to become opaque, to avoid capture by surveillance networks, to drop off of the grid. And I mean, someone like Zach Blass, who is an artist and also a theorist, has developed this idea of contra-internet aesthetics. And the idea is that if the internet is all about communication and circulation, but also capture, um, what's needed is actually opacity, secrecy, disappearance, exodus. And he talks about um, different kinds of ways that this might happen. Um, so it's not the same thing, but there are kind of rhymes with some of these practices where artists um, are kind of interested in remaining invisible because they can, in that way, um, escape capture by these networks. So a filmmaker that I've been writing about a lot is Gregory Markopoulos. And he's someone who, uh, working up until about 1971, distributed his films and everything, and then in 71 withdrew them all from circulation and lived the rest of his life kind of in obscurity, um, never showing his films publicly. And then now after his death, they've started to circulate a little bit, um, but 
The idea is that the great final work that he made would be shown only in a field in rural Greece. It's 80 hours long, it's 16 millimeter film, it's really difficult. The town is five hours outside of Athens, the nearest ATM is one hour away, there's like no internet there, and it started in 2004, these posthumous screenings, and then again in 2008, 12, and the next will be in 2016. Each time they show 10 hours of this 80 hour work, an ongoing premiere. I mean, that kind of cultic attachment to site specificity, to material specificity, and to completely dropping out of the kinds of networks of reproduction and circulation is something that I think, I mean, Markopoulos was planning this in the late 60s. Like, he always had this idea that it would happen. But why has it today become a kind of phenomenon that it never was when he was alive? Why do 250 people make this trip every four years? I think it's because it does, again, it's about this thing of tapping into something very deep about wanting to somehow have an experience that is absolutely singular and not reproducible. And so there's a way in which some of these very capital R romantic, authentic practices cross paths in a quite strange way with um, ideas of disappearance, obscurity, et cetera, that are talked about much more in new media activist circles, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> I would be interested in, um, again, the medium thing. So there's, if you use 60 millimeters or something else, and um, you spoke about this triangle and uh, of like object, subject, and society, and I had to think of intersubjectivity in a way, connected to authenticity, so it's kind of us that decides if something is authentic or not. And um, if you really think like the medium is so important to speak about like something true or authentic, or authentic, or if you maybe also can speak about it like with uh, fiction or like 16 media media as well or whatever, like is it really important in the medium or is it, isn't it more important like how we speak about things than with what we speak um, yeah, I mean, I think how is definitely important, but the medium tends to be one way that a desire for authenticity gets articulated precisely because um, there's often a kind of anxiety around new technology, right, and the kind of possibilities of circulation and replication of new technology. <coughs> And so if technology is in some way what's at stake, then it makes sense that technology or you know, a particular medium would be one way of pushing back against that. But it's certainly not the only way. Um, and in the Venice Encyclopedic Palace, there were a lot of examples of uh, kind of deployments of authenticity that were not based in a particular use of a medium, but had to do with an idea of a, a, a depth subject and drawing on either madness or the unconscious as a means of articulating a subjective authenticity. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm going to for the talk. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you how, how uh, to me it seems that we arrived in, at this question of transcendental For example, it reminds me of Pablo Florence is writing on icon how it is just within itself rather than like a presentation or something. And you do it with, with this sort of um, way of giving the actual matter of all rather than representation, of her, for example. And uh, secondly, um, I, I, I'm, I'm curious whether sort of emphasizing of this especially in particular art, uh, takes something out of it which is more playful. Like in cinema, for example, in film journalism film, um, uh, they used to, they, if they needed to recreate, say, East Berlin, they would do it in some part of expeditions. <laughs> and that kind of aided to, to film some kind of dimension, this fact that you could recognize that this is actually a street thing. So I think, um, what do you think about that? It Why tends to be quite an unfair discourse, it's true. I mean, it's very earnest. There's not a lot of humor. Um, so I agree with you. 
but I'm not sure that, what was your first question? I couldn't the question was how, how, how close um, does it uh, say object, out object, how close it is related to an, a notion of an icon where it becomes this thing mm -hmm. in itself rather than a representation of, say, some kind of thing, whether when it's imbued in sort of quality. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that, I mean, it's interesting because the relation, the, the example that Benjamin gives is this Madonna, right? Um, but I don't know that it has to do with the object itself possessing those qualities, except for a kind of endurance over time. Right, so often, like the aura is thought of as a sort of synchronic category that this thing just possesses this, and that to me seems to be what you're describing with the icon. But what's happening here, I think, is a description of the aura as a diachronic category that is something that actually develops over time as a particular object or image um, lives and accumulates a history and accumulates um, these traces. So maybe they're, you know, it's a similar kind of phenomenon, but they're operating on two different axes, one synchronic and one diachronic. Um, I don't know how relevant this is, but uh, I was re reading recently about the vorticists, uh, uh -huh. this kind of movement which actually embraced, as much as I understand the movements, it's about embracing the industrialization of every, of every aspect of everyday life. And uh, this seems to propose a completely uh, uh, opposite model to the model which you've been um, presenting here, I guess. What's, what's your opinion about this type of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a dialectic. These are two sides of exactly the same coin, right? The threat and promise of the possibility of an industrialized life and an industrialized art production. Right? So, for example, it's, it's entirely the case that you could write a complete, like, modern art history looking at artists who have embraced the possibilities of technology, um, whether directly or indirectly. Um, you could write a history of um, ways that the multiple, the economy of the multiple, has been embraced. And there is a sense that the, the idea of the multiple arts is this sort of small utopia this is what Salant calls it, a small utopia that runs throughout the history of 20th century art. Um, but that's always in concert with, I think, a much more um, traditional pullback from that. Right? So I see it actually as a kind of dialectic of rarity and reproducibility, so that repro the, the kind of uh, proliferation of copies spurs a desire for the authentic singular object but then the existence of this, the authentic singular object is something that is sort of um, overcome in turn by these copies. So it's actually um, a part of a single, a single system. And so that's actually like the, the kind of schema that I'm trying to describe in the book, but the talk today was only one, one half. The book is you know, about completing the circle. I think we have time maybe for one last question on the board, if there is one. Is, is the mic heading to uh, the question? Is there a... mm -hmm. <laughs> if not, I mean, one, one thing I would point you to just because um, Eric, you brought it up, um, uh, was I think the Gregory Markopoulos example was really fascinating oh, yeah. again. It's, um, that's something that, that you wrote about in one of these blogs. I think if you, if you were interested in the talk, I really would urge you to seek out this distribution dossier blogs on the website because I think they're fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you, thank you for all of your questions. They were great.